Hey folks, Kiltman here. Kiltman at your service. The Stuart Black, resplendent and gorgeous. And a Mad Max MFP, Main Force Patrol t-shirt. Harkening back to the original Mad Max. Hey, folks, how are you doing? Lockdown continues. Now, before we go any further, I'm gonna have to just admit to something here. There is some severe bang, bang, crash, crash, knock, knock, bang, bang, crash, crash, knock, knock, in that order taking place next door. Around about 30 feet in that direction. But it's traveling through the floor, it's reverberating through the walls. Now, Steve next door is cool. I like Steve. Um, but it, this did get me to think, what the fuck is he doing? What is he doing? Because the other day it was like this as well. I thought, what the fuck? What could he be banging into the wall? Apparently, apparently, Mrs. Kiltman told me that, oh, as soon as lockdown began, he got a shipment of, of floor tiles, so he's putting new flooring in. That's what he's doing. So I guess we'll let him off. But there's no point waiting to the time when it's quiet, because he's obviously he's working all day. So if I don't do it now, well, I'm never going to do it, am I? So, anyway, without further ado, um, I reviewed Colour Out of Space the other day. Um, Richard Stanley's awesome adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's short story. And of course it put me onto a Lovecraftian sort of, you know, roller coaster. So I watched some more movies, I read some more uh, original short stories, and I'm really, really Lovecraftian at the moment, yes. I've been calling out to great Cthulhu, you know, to come forth, come forth. And uh, on that note, there'll be some in interesting things arriving in the next few days. Well, give or take a few days because Amazon, yes, Amazon, are now saying, you know, because of coronavirus, certain things are being prioritised. Pretty much I get my stuff straight away. They've been really good to me because I've been really good to them, you know, and, uh, but I know some things are definitely coming later than, you know, you would expect. Anyway, anyway, enough of that preamble. Uh, keeping the H.P. Lovecraft vibe going strong, I watched Stuart Gordon and Brian Usner's fantastic follow-up to Reanimator, from Beyond, yesterday, from Beyond. Come on guys, you must remember this one. This is where Dr. Pretorius, played by Ted Sorrell, has developed the Resonator. The Resonator is basically three ginormous tuning forks stuck in a box with one of those great big uh, Frankenstein Castle laboratory. You know, one of them levers, you know, and things happen. And uh, basically what Dr. Pretorius has done, and he's a sadomasochist, by the way, which is a nice, weird little development, which kind of colours the whole way that this particular adaptation goes. Uh, he is, he, our five senses, you know, he doesn't believe that they're enough. We, we, we are enclosed, we can't see beyond the realm of touch, feel, smell, taste, you know, all this kind of stuff here. But there's things beyond that. There's a, a dimension which exists in us and around us, which we're not. Our senses do not give us access to, but with his device, the resonator, it will do so. And he's worked it out, it does work. And when it's activated, all of a sudden you can see into this other dimension. These little creatures are flying around. They're actually um, rubber johnnies, condoms, <laughs> which are like colored and like lit up and they're floating around in this kind of weird hypnotic sort of transcendental existential state. The thing is, don't move, because if you move, they can see you, and they're hungry. The resonator also has a different effect on different people. Uh, for instance, his assistant, played by the ever-awesome you know, Jeffrey Coombs, who was the reanimator, and he was brought back on board for this, and he then did a huge slew of stuff for Stuart Gordon and Brian Usner throughout Empire Pictures, and Full Moon Pictures as well. And... Uh, it stimulates his pineal gland. Now, folks, the pineal gland is located here. It lies dormant. It's not made up, it does exist. The pineal gland does exist. And I read about, when From Beyond first came out back in 1986, uh, a year after um, Reanimated, which was 85, and, uh, which I'm gonna come on to at some point. I'm gonna review that one as well, because that's awesome, Reanimator. And uh, I began to read up on this pineal gland. Does it exist? Did it's made up in a film? No, no, it exists. And apparently, uh, and this is this is great. <laughs> throughout evolution, it's 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 been lying dormant throughout pretty much all of 
mankind's you know existence on this planet but it is getting bigger and it is getting you know it's becoming more active they've studied it and it's definitely happening but so in the film Jeffrey Coombs' pineal gland is energized and activated and what it'll do it'll break out of a little you know a little orifice here and it'll come out like a little worm with a bud at the end of it but they have said that the shape of the pineal gland is like uh, the male genitalia so if evolution does follow the course of the movie <laughs> this movie we're all going to have you know great big penises coming up between our eyes so we're all going to be walking around like dickheads for real they're going to be a race of dickheads i've known it for a long time so it affects him in that way but Dr. Pretorius, and of course the name Pretorius stems from um, Bride of Frankenstein, which of course they would actually do a, a, a sort of revamp of with Bride of Reanimator. Cheeky, cheeky chaps, aren't they? You know, at Castle Pictures and Empire, and Full Moon Pictures. They were all together, all offshoots. And, um, but the idea behind it, the short story of, of Lovecraft is that, you know, if you encounter these creatures, you know, you're opening up another dimension, another realm, it's not safe to do so. The short story he wrote was about seven pages long. That's not much, but it's a great jumping off point for what Brian Usner, who wrote the screenplay for this, came up with. But in seven pages, Lovecraft can create entire worlds, dimensions, realms beyond our possible imaginings. He'll hint at stuff and threaten and warn, and in his story, uh, the, but the Jeffrey Coombs character, Crawford Tillingast, is the, the doctor in it. Dr. Pretorius doesn't exist uh, in the original short story. But he's gone mad because of what he knows. And he's basically unleashed these creatures on the servants in his house. And although the narrator of the story, whose name I don't think you even get to know his name, he never believed what Tillingast could come up with with the resonator. So he invites him back. And then, now I'm going to show you what it can really do. But ha they're going to eat you as well. Because he's gone completely fucking nuts. So. And, uh, and that basically is the prologue, the pre-credit sequence for the film From Beyond. Because in the story, you know, the narrator manages to destroy the machine. And the scientist, the mad scientist, goes into apoplexy, heart attack, dies. And this guy has to, you know, claim that he didn't murder him and he gets away with it. But in the opening sequence, Tillingast, Jeffrey Coombs, realises the machine is working. Professor, it's on, it's on! And, you know, Pretorius has got some, some woman in, his, in his, his sex dungeon with all sex aids, handcuffs, torture chambers. Fucking hell, he's into all sorts, this guy. But he's like, what? It works! Why didn't you tell me? So off he goes and the, the machine's on. And remember I was saying about Colour Out of Space, Richard Stanley's fabulous um, adaptation. And of course, to describe the Colour Out of Space, which Lovecraft couldn't do, he's basically saying you, you can't describe it, it's a shade which is unimaginable. Well, they use the shade magenta. And I was going on about this, magenta is a colour which we as humans can only perceive when two other colours collide in a certain light, but magenta does not exist on our colour spectrum, it just doesn't exist. It's a product of something else taking place and I was going to the, the colour magenta is used in colour out of space predominantly it's used in this as well <laughs> once the resonator is activated the whole world goes fucking magenta and it's a really lush sensual magenta as well and when Pretorius discovers this he's like <laughs> Tillingast Crawford can you feel it Ooh. And Tillingas has just basically just got like, oh, you know, he's got a headache. And he encountered one of these Lampia, as they're called. The production crew christened these monsters, these creatures, Lampia. And one of them saw him, locked onto him, bit a hole in his cheek. But he manages to get rid of that. And he's like, but Professor, it's, it's dangerous. No, it's better than that. Anyway, another big beast comes through. As Pretoria says, Crawford, can you feel it? And he's going, Professor, what, what? Something's coming. <laughs> and he gets his head bit off by a great big fucking huge beastie type creature from beyond. And Tillingast ends up getting, you know, uh, arrested and sent to an asylum wherein they're going to do all sorts of lobotomies and stuff on him. They don't believe a word of this crazy story. Enter Barbara Crampton. 
Yes, the gorgeous, delicious, still gorgeous, still working strong Barbara Crampton, who they used extensively in Reanimator. Nude sequences are plenty, and here she's an even she's a better performer in this. And even though she's not nude as often, she's far far sexier. Now she is this uh, this wonder girl professor of psychology. You know, she's only young and yet she's still managed to achieve so many doctorates and degrees and achieved so many miracles within that science. So other scientists, including, um, oh God, Stuart Gordon, the director, his wife, he always puts her in his movies and he always kills her off as well. And her name is yeah, Caroline, Caroline Perdy Gordon. And she plays this rather vicious, hardline, Nazi-like doctor who just wants to fucking experiment on everybody, you know. But because they don't believe he's mad, Let's, there's got to be something to this guy's story about a resonator in this house. Let's go and investigate it. So Crawford gets released and into her custody, into Barbara Crampton's custody, and they get a detective alongside him as well, played by Dawn of the Dead's Ken Free. Ken Free, yeah, playing Detective Bubba. <laughs> and he's basically he's our conduit into this unfolding story. He's the audience. He asks the questions. He learns, he stands there aghast at the things that take place while the others just, you know, investigate him like, oh my god, oh, look at this. And he's like, what the fuck, tell it off, you know. But, so they, they go to the house, just the three of them, and they find, there's a great, there's a chalk outline of the body of Pretorius on the deck, minus a head. <laughs> but of course, they're gonna put this resonator back on, and Pretorius, who was killed, lives on because he's now entered from beyond. He's entered the other realm and he's constantly mutating. But he sees this gorgeous doctor with her blonde hair and her big spectacles and her big chesticles and great stuff. And he goes, oh, Crawford, who is this you've brought to see me? And he's, he's all like gel and mutating and pushulence and all that like, but he wants to uh, bring her forward. Let me meet her. <laughs> and uh, He's trying to explain, look, look, you know, death, there's no death. You just move on. And to think, you know, we hesitated about this. Oh, Crawford, you know, you need to investigate this further. Join me, let's all come together. But he's clearly, his head fucking split. He takes his face off and he's going for this girl. So Ken Furry, the copper with, you know, he's got a fucking gun, like, no, bang, 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 shoots the whole thing, just go. It's all gone. But weirdly enough, the effects have been felt by all three of these uh, investigators. Crawford's now got his, this throbbing lump between his eyes. And possibly a throbbing lump between his thighs as well. Because Barbara Crampton's luscious doctor, luscious professor, has been stimulated by you know, the vibrations of the resonator. It's aroused her. So she's been stroking his arm throughout all this, even though this monstrosity has been like, you know, making inroads to get her. And, uh, but sadly, the only effect that poor Ken Furry as Bubba gets, he gets basically a hangover, fucking banging headache, and he's throwing up everywhere. <laughs> but without the pleasures of the alcohol beforehand. So it hasn't quite worked out for him. But the film then dovetails into escalating madness. Uh, Barbara Crampton's character becomes totally She's been changed, but purely sexually awakened. She discovers the uh, Dr. Pretorius' you know, fucking sex dungeon with all this sex aids and whips and handcuffs and chains and all sorts. And she puts all the rubber fetish gear on like, and tries to seduce you know, uh, Crawford Tillingas. Doesn't go for the, uh, the big buff Ken Furry, the huge fucking ex-football player, detective now. Only goes for him to try and, you know, try and stop him from removing him from the house when he realizes that things are going too far. But of course, the resonator will reactivate itself. Dr. Pretorius will make more reappearances. The creatures will come forth. More bitings will ensue. Poor Crawford will get sucked into this huge tentacled beast and he'll be dragged out with his head will be removed as well. Like, and he's got all sucker wounds all over him. Poor Ken Furry will, like, will discover that the, the creatures that don't move, because they'll see you. Oh yeah, they weren't lying. That's this infestation of little bugs devour him, literally, so he's just like a head, and everything else has just been shooed down to the bone, and he's just like sitting there wriggling. <laughs> Crawford in the meantime, because the whole, the doctor, Barbara Crownson, 
that vicious doctor back at the hospital who wants to lobotomize everybody. She will get the, oh, wonder girl, wonder doctor, yeah, yeah, and look at you now. And they open her up and she's got fetish gear on and she's like, and she's quivering. No, the resonator works, it's all real. The creatures are real. Right, electric shock therapy for her. No, you can't do it. <laughs> and Crawford's back there as well. Jeffrey Coombs, now hairless. And he has this pineal gland which will which will come out and tease this vicious doctor who's got a pair of you know, surgical pliers and she's trying to pull it out. And every time she reaches it, it goes whoop, back in again. Hey, whoop, back in again. Oh, oh, oh. basically it's doing that to it. Yeah. But Crawford, when he's left alone, the pineal gland will reawaken. And in a weird turn of events for him, it kind of stimulates something else in him. He gets like a, a sort of zombie-like craving for brains. So in the hospital, you'll find some brains in jars because there's always brains in jars. See, once again, this is like another, you, you can see elements of uh, the original Frankenstein stories. And that entire attic room laboratory is very, like a, a modern take on Kenneth Strickfadden's awesome set design for James Whale's original Frankenstein, which has all, you know, gyros, resonators, oscillators, all, you know, ancient electrical equipment, which they put in there and all lit up and buzzed and had sparks and stuff. Looked amazing. And that's what the attic room is. So of course, brains in jars plays a huge thing in the, Frank the Frankenstein mythos. So Crawford finds brains and he's munching on them. And this Nazi doctor, the wife of the director, uh, discovers him. Crawford, what's come over you? And he's like, oh, oh God, no, what have I done? And then he'll go for her and he'll pin her down, and he'll chew her eyeball out. <laughs> so it's a thing for brains and eyeballs, because he, he takes out a paramedic crew as well, and goes for the eyeballs on them. I don't know about that. Is he trying to get the brain out of the eye socket? I don't know. I don't know what he's doing there. Anyway. But Barbara Crampton and Crawford will end up back in this house, this house of horrors, on uh, Benevolent Street, as it's called. Taken from the original short story, Benevolent Street. And um, it's all filmed in Rome, by the way. Uh, Stuart Gordon and Brian Hughes, and the entire production, they got money was secured, the production was set to make three films in Rome. And this was the first one to do it. Or was Reanimator the first? Reanimator from Beyond and then Dolls, I think that was the, uh, the order, I think. So, they end up back at the, the house, and, you know, Pretorius is, is, is all over this fucking doctor again and Crawford he's he's gone mad completely mad but they've got to destroy this this resonator they've got to destroy this and lock away the lamp here from ever seeing our dimension again and it all goes very very kaboomy at the end and it's a it's a great colorful you know climax the film runs less than 90 minutes as a lot of uh, empire pictures and full moon pictures and castle pictures do they are short, sharp, colourful shocks. They were masters of working on low budget. And Reanimator put, put them on the map. From Beyond secured them as being a, a, you know, a genre uh, business which really could deliver the goods and make a huge profit as well and deliver cult films. In all honesty, I don't think they ever capitalised too well on the success of Reanimator and From Beyond. They went on to do two sequels to Reanimator, Bride of Reanimator and Beyond Reanimator. But Brian Usner took over. Now Brian Usner might be a good, um, you know, on time, low budget screenwriter. He can deliver exciting scripts, exciting story adaptations, but he's not a good director. And Bride of Reanimator is nowhere near as good as the first movie. It's got its moments, but it's nowhere near as good. I'll come on to that separately. Um, Beyond Reanimator is, absolutely shite and do not waste if you've not seen it don't waste your time with it it's a film that i couldn't I, i've got it but I, I couldn't watch all of it i got it because i had to have it as part of the collection and that's the horrible thing about being you know an obsessive collector of you know genre material you just you just feel it oh well they made it and i've got everything else i must have it as well and sit on the shelf why you know as i'm getting older i'm beginning to realize why don't do it because that was an absolute tear of the film um and also, he did Return of the Living Dead Part 3, which isn't bad. Isn't bad. It's got its moments again, but Usner is not as good, not as accomplished, not as polished 
hasn't got the finesse and the nuance of Stuart Gordon, who has now sadly died. He died about two years ago. And it is a real shame because the guy was still working, you know, and um, he could deliver these short, vibrant, vivid, graphic, explicit, and exciting, you know, uh, movies. From Beyond gets a massive double thumbs up from me. And uh, you're listening right now, and I'm going to turn up a little bit to the score to From Beyond. This is by Richard Band. Richard Band worked from the 70s to the 80s, into the 80s, and he's still working now. Um, scoring mainly for the 70s and 80s horror and sci-fi stuff and he's a master of blending um, a full orchestra with electronics he did the score very cheekily for Reanimator because the main theme from Reanimator is a total steal from Bernard Herrmann's score from Psycho and he got in a bit of trouble for this as well and I'll, when I discuss Reanimator I'll talk about that score and what he did uh, at length because I know a fair bit about that and it's I can't get my head around why he did it. I've heard conflicting stories, but it wasn't a clever move anyway. But I do love his music. I've got lots and lots of his soundtracks. And he worked a lot with Stuart Gordon and Brian Usner, uh, Empire, Full Moon and Castle Films. And his score for From Beyond, he jettisons the woodwinds altogether. He has strong you know, string section of 30, I think 35 string players and he has lots of archaic synthesizers, lots of old school sampling to create these, not themes, but motifs and to create this sensual, undulating, sort of glistening feel, this really erotic sort of vibe because we're all meant, he said, you know, when I wrote the music, I wanted to stimulate the audience's pineal gland. He said, that's I wanted to evoke this sensual excess that the, the resonator creates in people. And, it, and it, it's great, it is great. Let's get you onto some of this bizarre stuff. He'd, he'd use um, a system of uh, connected bells, glistening bells, which would make uh, the sound of the resonator to create that transition, the crossing of the two dimensions. Because these things exist all around us all the time. But they're not aware of us, and we're not aware of them until the resonator is activated, and then we can see each other. And these things are hungry, you know. And that's always the thing about Lovecraft. It's always things that they're not just, you know, the Necronomicon, which was, you know, found by the mad Arab, the mad Arab Abdul Al Hazrad. You know, if you know your your Lovecraft and your Arkham and your Miskatonic University, you'll know all this stuff. Like, but uh, not all is. Other worlds and you know monsters and creatures, entities are created by reading from the pages of, of the, the cursed book or enacting rituals. A lot of this stuff is sci-fi based, like H.G. Wells, but unlike Edgar Allan Poe and Bram Stoker, he wrote a lot of sci-fi. But like Alien is a sci-fi movie, but it's also a horror movie. Lovecraft mastered the ability to to blend sci-fi and horror into one. Melange, one melancholy, macabre melange, and it's a. Uh, this is absolutely. It epitomizes it completely. The ritual is the resonator, and it brings forth other creatures into our realm, and we can't deal with it. <laughs> but listen to this. It's this undulating sort of musical vortex that he creates. The effects of the film were done by um, Carl Buchler and Mark Shostrom. These guys worked on a lot of movies throughout the 80s. You know, uh, these were like, they came after the likes of Tom Savini and they'd work on Evil Dead 2 and uh, Pumpkinhead and stuff like that, you know. And obviously, you know, a lot of Stuart Gordon's movies, Return of Living Dead. And they did a lot of gore, but all practical effects and some of the effects in From Beyond are really good. When Pretorius, who becomes a big lumbering creature, which you can imagine that nowadays would be pure CG and it would look pure CG. This is a lumbering puppet. Somebody's in there and the arms and legs and it's a big misshapen mass. But with, and Ted Sorrell who plays Pretorius, his, they always used his face as well. They'd wrap him up in all sorts of glistening latex and you know horrible gloopy stuff. And his face would be there leering out, Crawford, yes. 
I'm coming for you. <laughs> and for you, my pretty. And he has these extendable fingers, and he does unwrap, unpeel Barbara Crampton, and have a bit of a, a gropage with his fingers from beyond. <laughs> Finding her nether regions as well. So as I say, you know, it, it's a good sci-fi horror movie. It's got plenty of gloop and gore. It's got a fabulous soundtrack. It's got great OTT, almost cartoonic panto performances from the likes of Jeffy, Jeffy Coombs and Ted Sorrell and even Ken Ferry. But that's not a bad point. In a film like this, where it's overblown and over the top, it's cartoonic. The colours are really vivid and in your face. Every scene looks like some psychedelic acid trip. It's, that's what you need. Brilliantly brazen, OTT, overacting. Jeffrey Coombs has made a career out of doing that. And he's never put a foot wrong. I love everything he's ever done. He's been brilliant. Well, I don't love them. I love everything he's done. Some of the films he's been in have been shit. Castle Freak, anybody? Yeah, by these guys. Shite. Again, that was another film where they had to go to Europe to make it, you know, because it was cheaper. I know it's got its fans, but Castle Freak and the likes of Cellar Dweller and, oh, even Dolls is a bit shit as well, you know. But these guys would also do Dagon, uh, and Dagon is another very, very short Lovecraft story about sea beasts, people becoming fish people, you know. And it's great, and the film Dagon is brilliant, I love that film, and uh, I'll be covering that at some point. But the short story is short, it's like that, it's about eight pages, if that. And like from beyond but this is the thing this is how you can use his stories even no matter how short they are as springboards because this for example in those scant few pages he hints at such possibilities and you just you want to know more this could be done they're great little stories in their own right but and they do conclude but they, they open up so many ideas so many possibilities that you could explore even further. So, for the extension of this story from beyond, they would visit other Lovecraftian stories and take little elements and poach them and put them in. And it works. From Beyond is a great movie. I have to say, just listen to this lilting, hypnotic, unusual score. There's lots of sequences where, lots of cables, there's people are forever plugging cables in and then realise, shit, take them out! And then the cables get a life of their own and begin to, because Pretorius' power is seeping into the real world so he can connect the resonator to give access, full access. I'm going to make a resonator, I've decided. Not a full-size one. I'm not that good. I'm going to get three tuning forks. Yeah. And I'm going to put them in a little sort of plastic base, a little clear, you know, um, plastic base, and I have like a little magenta, a little strip of magenta lights inside. I'm gonna switch it on, activate the tuning forks, and hopefully this magenta cloud will rise. And see what the effect it has on me. I don't need the resonator for full arousal. <laughs> this is just coffee, by the way. I've just discovered coffee. I've never been, I, I, I drink tea. I drink tea and I drink whiskey. And sometimes lager. But coffee is a thing like, ugh. Yeah. I mean, I drink coffee and I'm thirsty afterwards. But I quite enjoyed this, I'll be honest. I've been, since lockdown. I don't know why. <laughs> you know, why, why stay awake during lockdown? Jesus Christ. There's nothing happening. <laughs> There's nothing to do. Apart from construct your own resonator. Let, let's see how the labour's like that, eh? When I'm bashing and crashing and, you know, tuning, tuning forks. And I'll be playing this music dead loud as well, like. <laughs> You'll be knocking on the door, Chris, what the hell are you doing in there? And I'll have that, oh, sorry, Steve. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Anyway, folks, there'll be more Lovecraftian stuff coming. But uh, the next video is definitely, definitely a mask. A mask to show you. Uh, and I'm hoping that my original opinion of it has changed because once it arrived, I wasn't fussed on it at all. 
and I kind of shoved it out of the way and I thought, I'm meant to be reviewing this. I don't want to, don't want to discuss it. So hopefully a few days have gone by now and I might see it in a different light. I don't know. I don't know. But it's coming up anyway. So guys, in the meantime and in between time, stay stimulated. Keep it healthy. No, stay healthy and happy. Keep it kilted, keep it Celtic. And let's all resonate.